Hello, I'm Chris Lemaire. I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque, uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our virtual Q&A for On the Rocks. Uh, tonight, we're thrilled to welcome the brilliant filmmaker Sofia Coppola, along with the one and only Bill Murray. Uh, and tonight, we're also thrilled to welcome a special moderator, uh, filmmaker Jim Jarmusch is joining us. Before we welcome all of them, I just want to thank Apple TV Plus for making this event happen, uh, and of course, providing all five films in the uh, in our Apple Original Film Spotlight this weekend. So, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. Are Hi, there? Hi, Bill Murray. Hi. Oh, we lost you. Oh, I'm sorry. I kept doing it, and it kept telling me I wasn't fast enough or something. Back. Good. Okay. It's funny, I'm seeing, uh, am I seeing chats down there? Oh, they're very strange. <laughs> Saying, scare me. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> anyway, you guys, happy Valentine's Day to everyone and to you guys. It's Thanks. kind of a, a lovely thing to have on the rocks as a Valentine's film. It's such a, it's such a kind of lovely film about, a, about love in a strange way. So... I don't know, I wanted to start with just asking you, Sophia. <clears throat> I, I was listening to a conversation earlier today uh, that you had some time ago with Paul Schrader about, I think it was mostly about First Reform, but you guys were talking about your approach. And uh, he, Paul said he doesn't write ever with characters in mind, but I think that's not the case for you, correct? With actors? I mean, with actors in mind to to be those characters. Yeah, it, it helps. It helps a lot. It helps me a lot. Um, I started thinking about this. Looks. I, I didn't think it go right away because I it felt like too much. Again, in a, I was talking to Mitch about the idea, and he, Mitch Glazer, our friend and a fellow writer and producer. And um, and I was I was thinking I would I would love to see as that character, and he encouraged me to just get past my fear of us being together again because I didn't I felt like that, that people loved Bill's character in Lost in Translation, and I felt like it was, I would I didn't want to disappoint anyone with what would we we do, and um so I, but then once I kind of it helped me a lot when I was on script to, to make up this character and imagine Bill um and what he would bring to it and, and his expressions. And so it helped, it helped me a lot. So you use him visually while you're writing, imagining him. I do. I mean, I remember in Lost in Translation, I imagined him at the bar and it kind of was this whole kind of imaginary world of Bill showing up. And and um, when Felix, when, yeah, when I started picturing Felix, it, um, it was so fun to imagine what he would do. But then of course, it's always a surprise when when the real Bill shows up as a character, as you know, the, the fun of working with Bill is just, um, it's full of surprise. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was some, well, there's something very beautiful about uh, Bill and Rashida together. There's something, I did you write for her as well? Because they just, it's so beautiful how they work together. Yeah, I, I think, thank you. I think so too. I, we, we did our Christmas special, they had a, and Bill and Rashida, and that's when I first saw them together. And I thought that I would love to have the two of them together, and they have such a great rapport. And I know they both like each other. So I, I was picturing with as well. So it really helped me write this between Bill and Rashida. Yeah, she, she's fantastic. I, I love it. Just starting in the first scene there together in the restaurant is so. There's something so subtle about her reactions to Bill, to Felix. And, uh, but it was hard a little for me knowing you, Bill, personally to separate you at times. I know, I know Felix was saying things you wouldn't say for sure, but, I, <laughs> but when you take her in that sports car and you, you have caviar already and everything's already. It seemed like something very familiar to me. And also when you talk those cops out of giving you a ticket and helping you start the car and all that, these seemed like things I'd kind of witnessed before in real life with you. So 
Uh, obviously, you're playing a character, but it's again a very, su very beautiful, subtle things you guys did together. I think, I think um, there was definitely the part of able to engage with life and a, you know, the way he wants the flowers and his um, the way you jump into life. I wanted the character to have that too. Um, and uh, and the sorry. I'm sorry, how things become popular, you know, when, when, um, when Bill's around or certain people that have that quality that can make things into a fun adventure. Um, it's a very interesting thing to me that you, uh, you know, this film is a kind of, um, for you and Rashida in real life, you know, it's something a real life connection this theme of daughters with in real life larger than life fathers which you both have and it's a very beautiful portrait of that in a way i know it's not autobiographical but obviously there's things of you in this as in all, all your films but I, I was just wondering how you and rashida did you write it for her as well or how, you know obviously she was aware of this theme that you both have in real life to it to a degree as well yeah when I, I started talking to her on the script and um in picturing and bill and um and yeah it helped that she understood the the dilemma and the dynamic of the character and um i mean i hope it's i hope it's universal even if you don't have a big charismatic father because it's such an important relationship um and that, but looking at it as an adult woman and that relationship, I, it definitely helped to talk about it and, and to have that in common. And uh, Bill, had you you'd worked had you worked with Rashida before? I think you were in one episode of um, Angie Tribeca, a show that I love. Um, <laughs> you were in one episode, correct? Yes, I was in one episode, and I did not understand the show at all because. Uh, and it, I think it was one of their first shows, maybe even their very first show. And uh, it was a kind of a camp cop show where everything was sort of uh, played. Everything was sort of classic cliche writing for cop shows, something like SUV or Law and Order, something like that. But it, since it was their first show, they didn't sort of, I don't think anyone knew what the tone was. And I didn't know what the tone was. And I didn't know whether... I didn't know what I was doing in this show where everyone sort of speak, speaking a kind of like a knuckleball kind of English kind of. So uh, I, I, all I did was the best I could, but I like, uh, I like, I've gotten to like her more all the time. I, I was also in an episode of uh, Parks and Recreation where I played the mayor after he died. So I thought I only had to do, I had one scene basically, which was in a casket. That was my one scene, but I did get to meet that whole cast and spend a whole day with them and enjoyed Rashida very much and all those people. We also did this Christmas show together. That was a really beautiful short scene in, in the Sophia's Christmas show. And then, you know, we had this difficult, you know, I mean, I guess I can speak to it because it's a fact. Um, you know, Rashida came to the movie very soon after her, her mother passed away. So it was a very, it was a, it was a very, it was a, it was a tower leaning, we were all leaning on each other, you know, and Sophia was sort of the, you know, we, we just leaned together and tried to get through it. You know, making movies can be hard. And when your heart's not all there, your heart's somewhere half out into space, you know, it's, it's really hard to work. And uh, I, I just thought Rashida was incredibly, uh, I think it was a good, you know, how they, the corny way people say, well, it's probably a good thing she had something to work or put her mind to. But I think it was good to be with Sophia and, and others like Sophia that Sophia brought to the movie. People that really care about other people, good, fine people who are, who are just able to buck us all up. You know how it is. And you're just trying to buck everybody up every day. And, and at the end of the movie, Rashida just, uh, I thought was, glad she'd done it and we were so glad she did it because she was superb I don't know why I went off on that tangent but that was that was the job was it was sort of 
it, it was kind of, they made the job in a way sort of the game within the game, you know, that was just, oh yeah, we also have to make this movie. And it was a, it was an interesting challenge as a, as a director, I think, to, to keep everybody, keep everybody pedaling, you know? Yeah, well, of course, Sophia, as always, you did a beautiful job of realizing it. But I was thinking after the fact about Rashida's character, uh, Laura, it's actually quite a complex character, you know, and she never, it's, it's your script, Sophia, and your kind of touch of filmmaking, but she, it's never labored or made too heavy. It's a heavy thing in her life that's happening. And yet uh, she played it just very kind of, I don't know, you felt for her, you see it in her eyes, you see it in her ways that she, her reactions to you are just kind of priceless throughout, I think. But she really maintained that kind of real, I don't know, kind of delicate subtlety. And so there's a loving thing, you know, you're talking about difficult making a film and you have other things in your lives, but th this film is about love. And, uh, you know, I'm from the very beginning of the film, I gotta say, when, when Felix first appears, I thought, oh, well, you know, Bill's character is gonna make problems and he just wants to, he wants attention <laughs> from her which in the end is, you know, a lot of the story, but I, it's very nice, the kind of love within this film that you feel. And it is a kind of, uh, well, two things, and I'll, I'll shut up for a second. It's, it's a story about family, you know, in a way, her family. And it's also a kind of love letter to New York City. So I wanted to just talk about you guys to talk about that. And you, Sophia, I know you love New York. You live in New York. You have lived in New York. Um, and it must have been strange to shoot. It wasn't consciously strange at the time, but it's the last kind of pre-COVID celebration of the city. So, and I haven't filmed in New York for many, many years outside in the city, but how how was it filming in in? Manhattan a lot of the most of the film yeah it was the first time I ever got to film in New York and it was it was so exciting to be able to around the city and it was so important because it's set there to be able to really shoot New York which you know it's hard to do it was challenging but it was fun to be all over the city and and we didn't realize um until after yeah how lucky we, that we got to have that moment New York that was so carefree and and, um, and luckily we, we finished last part of our sound mix right before things closed down and I, I feel for all the production had to keep filming or you know or were interrupted it's that so hard but um but yeah I feel so lucky that we got to kind of we didn't realize it that we got to capture New York in that easy way and, and I, I hope I'm glad that people get to the restaurant with Bill and Rashida and hopefully have that experience and again, but I wanted to um, try to show all those New York places and sort of the romance. I remember as a kid coming to New York and kind of up uptown New York and going to the Russian Tea Room. And so um, being able to, the fact that like 21 and the Carlisle let us really film there meant a lot to me to be in those real places. And I think we all felt it being you know, that it always makes a difference in in making the scene that you're in these real places with history. And, and they were really at the table where Bacall proposed, where Bogart proposed to Bacall eating ice cream Sunday. So that that was a highlight. I figured that was the real table. Yeah, that was a really great moment. And where did you film in the, the resort in Mexico? In Mexico? Well, that was Las Alamandas um, near Puerto Vallarta, right, Bill? Is that where we flew into? Um, yeah, and uh, that's Isabel Goldsmith, who was, who was kind enough to let our whole production take over um, at the end of our shoot, which was, um, which was a fun adventure. And I wanted to have a big contrast to, to New York and kind of have a Blake Edwards moment that, that um, Felix takes on a, a the adventure in, um, in the last part. Oh, Bill, I love your uh, musical number down in the, at the resort. Fantastic. Did it set in the? Did Paul Schaefer? He was helping you with the, that part of the musical stuff. 
Right. Paul, um, Paul sent me up and I'm, 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 I'm gra gra grabbing this name right now because he's a great guitar player. I, I want to remember it. I can never remember his name. His name is John Tropea, and he's one of the great uh, guitar players, session players. He's written many famous songs. And uh, Paul set me up with him to learn this song just in a little record, you know, in a little uh, rehearsal studio in, New studio in New York. And it was so much fun playing with him. I don't know whose idea it was, but John said, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I could come down to Mexico with you. <laughs> and he came down and play, you know, when you, you know how it is, when you're playing with an extraordinary musician, it forces you to, to play far above your ordinary level. And uh, it was just, you know, all the conditions were in my favor to sing that beautiful song I mean, the ocean behind the sunlight, the, the flowers, Rashida coming at me in this beautiful yellow dress and this extraordinary musician finger picking this, this song on, a, on a, an exquisite guitar. So I just, I was, uh, I was lucky enough to have all that inspiration at one second. And, uh, you know, like a lucky, lucky guy. A great moment, and I love your. Uh, you got to utilize your falsetto at the end there too. <laughs> Excellent. That was the first time that Rashida and any of us heard the song. Bill kept it. You know, I, I knew which song they they had talked about, but I had never heard it until that moment we were filming. And so Bill was really doing it for us for the first time, and we were all surprised by the the ending. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. Coming in with them, with him. The birds were accompanying him. Oh yeah, tell 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 Jim about the birds, Sophia. There were some like loud tropical birds that kept kept uh, chiming in and singing along with him. We had to like keep trying to redo it, but he's in there. He was trying. To <laughs> nice. Well, up here in the northwest, we uh, in the northeast we have these imitating birds, um, cat birds, and brown thrashers and mockingbirds. And they will mimic you, like uh, if you have an argument with someone, they might overhear part of it. They will uh, start imitating other birds or saying people's names. Or, and it's very unsettling because you wouldn't think in the Northeast there would be birds imitating you or cars backing up or phones ringing, but they really do. They're, they're very curious and attentive. So. Um, I, you were lucky Bill didn't break out into his usual uh, standby of the song Brandy, which I, <laughs> have you heard, Sophia, Bill sing Brandy? You, you have. Not about I but thought I he might break into it at a, for a moment there in the film, but no, he didn't. That was great. Yeah, I'm glad. It's always, I always want to have a number when Bill's around. <laughs> Um, wow. Also, I just wanted, you know, talking about music and the score, and there's music by Phoenix throughout the film, which is very close to you. Um, was the score written after the fact, like looking at picture? Is that how you usually work? Yeah, you know, I've never really done it the traditional way, but tomorrow's my hero. I, um, Tomat and his band Phoenix are in Paris, and so I would just send them scenes as we were editing. And even when we were filming and then they would write music and send it back to the edit. So it was always fun to get music and then kind of um, find which which one helped me or fit with it. But they were they were responding to the, the clip, the images. And, um, well, you have a lot of musical, you have uh, people in your family that are composers and conductors. And uh, I was just curious, and you're obviously have a very musical approach to filmmaking. I just wondered how do you listen to music when you're writing? Do you ever do you listen to music while filming at all? Do you have I, musical ideas that guide you in terms of the kind of movement of the film at all? Or how, how does it work for you, music? Yeah, sorry, but it, it cut out for a second. But um, I, I mean, I think I always think about the tempo when you're um, when you're editing, you know, kind of finding the rhythm of the, the movie and the tone. And, and luckily Sarah Flack 
my editor that I love working with is, has really good, really good with music and that's one of her talents. So um, she, she actually worked really well with music and that helpful to, to kind of find the rhythm together. Yeah, she's very musical and uh, again, a beautiful job on her part. Uh, she has a very, you guys, what you create is very strong editing wise. I've been watching your work together for so long and uh, it's always very kind of invisible the cutting unless you guys choose for it to be evident in a way. But usually you, you avoid that unless there's a reason. And uh, yeah, I thought about this film, its movement afterwards and thinking about Sarah Flack being a, a kind of musician for sure, you know? Um, Bill, did you, were you listening to music? Did your character get informed in any way besides of course the beautiful song? Well, I, I like to play music on the set. I just feel uh, uh, that it, it helps just the spirit of the, of the movie. I feel like it gives the, the crew tempo, you know? That without, like with a rhythm, people can move with a tempo. And I feel like if you can keep people doing the drudge work, you know, of moving and pushing and all that kind of uh, work that you, where you don't immediately get a response to what you've done, I, I feel like that's very important on, on the job. Um, uh, and when we were there in, certainly in Mexico, there was music all the time. Uh, it just, the whole place just feels like a, a, a serenade. And uh, we had a, a wonderful Mexican crew while we were down there. And they appreciated having the, the, the music too. You know, they, they really responded to it. It seemed like it was very close to their, or their being, their ordinary way to have music. Um, there, there were, you know, it's, it's, it's like what you said about Sophia and Sarah's editing. There is a, there, it feels like the, someone is singing along with the movie, you know, or humming along with the movie as you watch it. They cut it that way. and. It shoots that way. Um, yeah. Our, the, the, even the way the shooting goes, it feels like, you know, and when, when the words action happen, everything seems to be a, almost like a dance, you know, and that's that people are moving in a certain kind of a, a rhythm that's been, you know, the rehearsal kind of gets to it and everybody sort of finds the groove that Sophia sets and that, and then we go, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're very right to see it that way. It's, and it's, it's delightful. It keeps, you know, even in between takes, you feel the, you feel the beat inside of you. You know, you feel the beat and you don't lose it. You keep it and it's, it's easy to maintain over a number of takes over, you know, a little bit of time in shooting and changing directions and whatever. Hey Bill, when well, you were shooting um, alone in the car driving, were, were you listening to music? I feel like, do you remember? I can't remember. At one point, there's a close-up of him in the car alone driving to the city. At one point, Philippe Lassard, the DP, and, and Bill just got in the car and went because there wasn't room for anyone else. And then I can't, when they came back, it was fun to see. But, but it's him being, it's, it's such a touching moment because you're alone and you really feel like Felix is a quiet moment alone. But, and we added classical music later, but I wondered if, if you were listening to it at the time. Do you remember? Well, it, there, there's a little bit of each. Um, sometimes it's fun, and it's been a long time. Uh, if, if you drive into the city and you have one of those satellite uh, um, radios, you can't hear any music because they all blip out because of those buildings, but you can hear local FM from New York, you know, and that's kind of one thing uh, that it, when you're in movement, that's great. If we're moving, I, mean, I like to listen to the music, but when we're sitting still, I, I like to turn it off and just feel the, just listen to the city. I like to just hear the quiet and make a, put all that noise inside of myself. Sophia, I would have been nervous Bill driving off with nobody else because I've had him do that and not come back, you know, or come back maybe a few hours later. We're like, do you think Bill's going to come back? And then he does. And then he has like, I don't know, hunting hats as gifts for the crew or Four hours later, I don't know. I'd be nervous. I trusted uh, to leave our, our DP. I knew he'd get him back. 
Now, um, Philippe uh, Lesourd, you worked with him before. Uh, I know, I, I, well, he shot the Grand Master with Wong Kar Wai, that's incredible. And, and he shot the Beguiled, correct? Did yeah. you work with him on other films as well? Or? No, I just met him before the Beguiled and we did, we did a few commercials together. And, um, and then, um, yeah, this is our second film. Yeah, I love him. With him. Well, I love his light, and I always love your camera positions and the way you you build a film again without it being uh, not being conventional and yet also being kind of invisible in a in a beautiful way. And, th and this film certainly it fit the kind of lightness of this film, the photography and the the light. I ha I have one silly question though. Uh, what was the drink that Felix orders for? Laura, uh, in the first scene, you ordered a drink. It seemed, I, I don't know my cocktails, a drink with a very funny name. Do you remember, Bill? I can't remember now. It's not, I, have, I thought they had martinis the first. I think he ordered a martini, which is like lunchtime, and he's got to fix the kids, and he orders her like two martinis, I think. Maybe it was later. There's one point where. Felix orders a drink for her that I, I didn't know if you guys, if Bill made that up or you did, or was it a real cocktail, but I don't remember the name of it, so. It was in Mexico, I can't remember. Do you uh, remember? Well, did we drink French 76s at one point? And then we had, you know, I had, I had to explain to her that a martini is made with gin, not vodka. A vodka martini is made with vodka. A real martini is made with gin. I can't remember what that other drink was. I think that ended up in the editing room before. I don't think that made that into the cut about the vodka genie. Maybe it did. Good. Okay, good. You know, this this was some kind of a drink with a name like a Singapore sling or a depth charge or some kind of funny name. It wasn't that. Though. <laughs> All right. Well, Rashida would know. We could call Rashida. She would she would know. She remembers. Yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to ask was about the character of uh, Jim. Um, I, was, I was drinking him at the time, so I can I can't really be expected to know what. <laughs> yeah, this you, was. yeah. You're you're forgiven. Yeah, you shouldn't remember. But the character, the driver, Musto. Oh yeah, Mus Musto. Where did he come from? That guy's great, and that's his real name too. So I was curious about him. Yeah, we just met him in the. I was auditioning after, and then. Um, Originally, the driver had a different nationality based on like a friend's father's driver. But then we met Musto and he decided it was a great name. And he was he was a very good sport. To, um, it's hard drive shooting. <laughs> you know, and I knew I knew better, but I couldn't help having all those scenes in cars. And um, and uh, yeah, so he was else kind of sidekick. But he a lot of the time he was really driving them around and. and I did uh, he seemed familiar, not not realistically, but it just seemed like such a familiar kind of. He seemed like he would be Felix's driver. I, I love that that detail. Mm -hmm. He was very sympathetic, and uh, he never agitated for getting uh, himself into on camera. He never mm -hmm. wanted to have lines. I was always trying to cheat and get him into the give him lines and give him things to say. He had no interest in being on camera. He was completely content to just listen to everyone. And if anyone asked a question, he would have, he would have the answer if he, if he would give the answer if he had it. He was a cool guy. Well, just a detail about that. Also the way Sophia films things, you know, you, you only really see him from the point of view of the back seat, which I thought was really interesting. And, and yeah, just a detail, but those kind of details, you know, accumulate and er enrich how you feel about being in a, a world of a film. So uh, I like that a lot. There wasn't full frontal things on him, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was incorporated in, into the story in that way. Uh, we haven't talked about Marlon Wayans too. Did you write for him or uh, did no, you ca cast him after? After I didn't know who the husband was gonna be. I was really, um, you know, thinking about Bill and Rashida and I didn't know who he was and then uh, my great casting advisor Fred Reese casted Marlon, and um, and so I met him, and, and he was so he's so charming and lovable. I I think he would bring so much to it because the cut, even though it's not the main part of the story, it's it's you don't care about 
their relationship, the story kind of doesn't work and you, and so it was really important who that, not just be like the, the guy and not it's a boring guy. So the fact that Marlon has so much personality and, and helped a lot. And I, I love the scene and Marlon have that one moment. I wish they had more together, but um, it was cracking me up. Outside on the street when he's going in and Felix is coming out. Yeah, that's a kind of intense moment. Well, he's always so busy and believably so, you know, the character of Dean that he is really wrapped up in things. I, I like very much the casting of um, Fiona. Uh, I didn't know that actress, but the character, you know, when we see her from a distance and we're spying on them and, you know, you're starting to think, you know, that bitch, she's, you know, <laughs> and then when you when you do meet her in the end, it's it's really great. I just I like that actress too, uh, Jessica Henwick. Is it? Yeah, I really anyway, like. I, I liked how you treated that character very much. I'm glad that yeah, she's like she's threatening, and she turns out to be really nice, and yeah, she was great. She was really funny. Wow, she was great. It it's interesting how we don't really see her until that. End scene. I mean, we see her from a distance and we kind of see her a few times, but I, I liked how we were, she was kept away from us, you know, but yeah, we what, are magic. Yeah, I wanted to stay in Rashida's character's point of view and, and it's always worse than you, what you can imagine is always worse than really seeing it to keep her mysterious and get, let, let her be. The scene with um, Felix and the children, with his grandchildren, was so great. And I've got to work with Bill with children before. I've also got to see, observe Bill with children. I was just curious how, was some of that improvised or it was so playful when he, when he asked them if his feet smell or things like that. I love that. I love that scene very much. So real, you know, completely real. Well, this might be uh, a good moment to jump into some audience questions, if that works, Jim. Are you? Did, did you have something you were going to ask first? <laughs> no, I, I don't know if I'm a very good moderator. So let's keep it moderate. <laughs> and uh, anyway, no, this, no, this has been great. And please, please jump in. You know, like if you have anything to follow up and ask about as we go through some of these here. Uh, the first question is for Sophia. It's, could you please talk about your wonderful use of color in the film? How did you, for, how did you first start discussions with your collaborators and how did the, you then develop that, pal that palette? Oh, thank you. That's, um, I really start with uh, talking to the art department, costume designer, Pat and Philippe was and Ross, the production designer, and we just start looking at references and pictures and try to figure out what the world is going to look like. And then a lot of it comes from the like, wanting to shoot in real places and, and, um, and that in kind of. uh, Here's one for Bill. Uh, did you feel a difference between working with Sophia on Lost in Translation and nearly 20 years later for this film On the Rocks? Uh, how has she evolved as a filmmaker? Well, she, I, I can't speak about evolution because I, I don't have any idea about it, but uh, <clears throat> she's always known exactly what she wanted to do. Um, when you say what it was like working then, we made that first movie in 28 days, shooting uh, upside down the entire time. First on the, the Japanese jet lag for the first half of the movie, and then shooting nights for the second half of the movie. So. It was a completely disorienting, physically disorienting job. And it made it very dreamy. It made the whole thing very dreamy. And it gave it a kind of a, you were always trying to fight your way to consciousness, you know, somehow, you know, trying to fight your way back to consciousness. And that's, that kind of played for the way that we told the story. This particular job it, um, was different in that you were trying to find some sort of truth that was invisible. You were trying to find something that may or may not have occurred. So it was, it was, it was sort of inside out. It was like turning the pocket inside out of, of, of a movie and trying to find something that is, turns out, will turn out to not exist. So you're, you're beating, beating a rug, trying to 
get the dust out of it at the same time, hoping that nickels and dimes and gold coins come out. Um, it was uh, it was it was a lot easier to make the movie in New York. They were very respectful of my uh, of my maturity at this point, and I got I had easy hours. Sophia set me up like a like an angel, just to not have to work. I'd get to go home before rush hour. I'd come in later. I wouldn't have to work all through the night. They'd make they'd make other people take the last horrible shots of the evening, even though she was staying. She I'd get to go home. So she's, you know, very, very thoughtful. And that's kind of what a great director does. They think about you not just as a, as a role, but as a person. So that's her evolution. She's always growing as a woman. Now she's a, you know, a mother, a, a, a wife. She's, uh, she's just wonderful to work with and to be with and to know. So similar to that, this question is for Sophia. How would you describe the way you direct your actors? Do you have a particular method or is it more improv based on the actor? Oh, I'm not sure. I rehearse before before we start figuring out how we're going to shoot it. So that's really helpful to see where the actors walking and see where they're comfortable and what ideas they um, come up with. And then figure out how to shoot it and then I just try to give feedback of um what I had in mind but that. <laughs> it's always mysterious but I think just you, you have some fun try to convey it and then I'm always open to what the actors um, want to try and bring to it and then see how to do it. Well, well, back to Bill on this. What's the difference between working with Sophia and working with Jim here? <laughs> Someone is interested in, in that. And they're, they're also big fans of Broken Flowers and Lost in Translation, they're saying. Mm. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would just say that they would enjoy working with each other. You know, mm. I think Jim would like to work with Sophia and Sophia would love to work with Jim because they, uh, they bring a very high intelligence uh, to the job. Uh, as people, what I was saying about Sophia goes in space for Jim. Um, he's he's probably made some more movies, and he's maybe dealt with uh, some even stranger people than were in the movies that Sophia and I did together. But uh, that, <clears throat> like like the last one we did, The Dead Don't Die. That was a movie that was very very difficult to make. It was a even though it looked like it could have been easy, there were so many difficult challenges in it that would have broken or at least fractured an ordinary director. And the sort of intelligence that, that Jim brings to uh, situational uh, problems, which is what a director has to do all the time. I, I, that movie had like, thunderstorms and tornado warnings and floods and incredible heat and insects and zombies you know it was just one thing after another going wrong <laughs> and and how we, every day you came to work the, the man was just even you know just really like, all right here we'll do this again it was like a new deal it was like a, the last uh, hand of cards has been played let's play a new hand because there'll be a completely different hand, uh, poker hand in you, that you've got to play and you got to play it every day. But they're, they're both good at, at that, at, at, at that activity. And, um, and, but really the intelligence thing comes into dealing with people, I think, and, and making sure that everyone understands that we're all going through this. This isn't a personal attack on any one department or actor or person on the job. We're all going through this. If it's your problem, it's my problem. And that's what real movie makers understand. Um, another question for Sophia here is, on the topic of the script, I, I loved how mellow in the best way it felt. It felt very real and very dramatic without the need to over-dramatize things. How did you go about making sure it felt real? Oh, thank you. I always try to make it feel as naturalistic or as real as we can, but then it's a movie too, so it's fun to make it a little more romantic or more beautiful maybe than reality. So I try to make it beautiful, but still, I think because the actors are, um, you know, can be real emotion to 
pieces of them, it feels real. And um, and yeah, so I just wanted to, I, yeah, I try to make it as much how I think it might really be in, in life and, um, and not movie, try to make it feel as real as we can. But then the fun part of, of the movie, that contradicting myself. Um, and, um, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I, I love Jim's movies. And I remember when I saw Stranger Than Paradise and just, I was aspired to make movies that had some poetry to them. Or I think that, that, that we both I saw had inspires me about Jim's work and I always wanted to do that in my work. Oh gosh, you guys are embarrassing me now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You should see what you look like when you blush, Jim. It's really something. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another question about the script for Sophia. How much time did you spend crafting the script and did it have a lot of rewriting? Well, I worked on the script for so long, for years and years. I would I would write it and then not know what to do and put it away and come back to it. And I knew that I, I really wanted to do the story, but I didn't really know how to do it. And I, I'm not really a lot driven person. So I, I worked on it a really long time. I, I find writing to be the hardest part. And um, and yeah, it took me, it took me years to kind of get through it. And I had different, I had different versions. And um, I did a table reading with my cousins one summer when I was stuck trying to figure it out. And um, so yeah, it took, it took a while. And so it's a relief that we're actually here talking about it done. Well, follow up to that is for Bill, the question is, can you talk about the moment Sophia approached you with the script and what your first reaction was? Uh, go ahead, you you know better, Sophia. What happened? What happened? <laughs> kind of, you were just sort of forced into a table read. Maybe that was the beginning of us. The sheet came out and we said, we're going to, yeah. I think that was. I think the first time Rashida came out to New York for one day, and we cornered Bill into doing a table reading with us. Does that sound right? There was some muscle involved. There was some feminine muscle involved in it. I remember that. <clears throat> Can I yeah. ask you, Sophia, a quick question? <clears throat> when you write, do you, do you gather ideas for a while and then sit down to form it into a script or do you just start in with, I mean, do, and do you write on a laptop or in a notebook? I'm just curious. Yeah, I I feel like for years I had just like an inkling of this father-daughter adventure and, and a friend of mine had a crazy story where her and her dad were hiding in bushes and spying on her husband. And so I had this idea that I wanted to make that movie and it was like, it's like, it's like a vague dream or something you're trying to remember and like a little, but I would write little bits of scenes and try to kind of keep any little moments and little scenes that I did know. And then, and then when I had enough of those, I sat down on my laptop and just started writing it in the format. I always think it's always fun when it starts to look like a script. So even if it's only a few pages, when it's all formatted in final draft, I always find that exciting. Yeah. Well, we've also got a lot of questions about Improv. Can can you and Bill talk about any improv that happened on set? And there's some questions about Jenny Slate. Did she improv any of her lines? <laughs> yeah, some of those. I mean, there was really dialogue of things I had overheard at school drop off, and then and then she and I would so she would start with that, and then she would just go off on a tangent. And it was really funny when we were shooting. It was really fun to watch. I was cracking up, and and stuff like with the family and it was with Bill just to have him be around those little kids. And for them, there was some parts scripted to see how they played around was so fun to watch. And, and, and that's obviously one of the great things about working with Bill and Rashida that they are great at um, coming up with stuff and improvising around what the meat of the scene is. So it always adds, there's always funny moments. I love when you speak Russian to the, the waitress at that first lunch. Um, when you see Batsuba or like it, I, you're speaking Russian to the, the waitress and there's just little, little things that, um, that Bill adds that's always, always you know, the, the fun to watch. Um, um, anything to add to that Bill about any of the improv? <laughs> well, just, go ahead, Sophia. When you walk out of the party backwards, 
that you and Rashida came up with that he's like, come on, you know, sneaking out of the like fancy cocktail party. And it makes the scene, um, you know, so much more fun. And we're just having fun playing around and stuff. And it's like, Yeah, that, those those kinds of things are fun to do. Most, you know, people always wonder how much of a movie is ever improvised, and and except for every once in a while when a scene just doesn't work and you write something or improvise something, improvisation really comes in most handy. Um, just trying to get you in and out of things, you know, just trying to make a, a transition comfortable, and that's and if you learn how to improvise, that's really where it's most effective. You, there's just a, I've always, so I would repeat myself, but scripts are in two dimension. They're written on a piece of paper. And when you put them in life in the third dimension, there's some little thing sometimes that's not accounted for. And that's where any, you know, some improvisational talent can help to just sort of get you from, oh yeah, we forgot something about closing that door. It can be something physical, audible, movable, uh, visual. And there's just something that's just not there. And if you're, you know, if you're on the, you know, if you're on the job and you're looking and if you have a director who, you know, keeps it, keeps the, keeps the scene alive, you know, you find things and things just naturally occur. If you're engaged with the other actors, it just sort of happens. There's a movement of energy and it makes your body or your face or your voice do or say something. Well, we're short on time, but I think we have time for w one more question. Um, there's a lot of people in the chat that loves the music, obviously, from Phoenix, and uh, they're asking, how has your relationship with the music with music in your films evolved through the years, Sophia? Oh, I always, I always look forward to that part in the edit, and um, I try when I'm editing not to use music during the scene because music always makes the scene better, so make it work without music, then you have a better sense that the scene works and then enhance that. But um, I don't know how it's changed. I just always, always love that part and that it kind of helps the fun part and it helps check the out and make it. And having Bill say the truth. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we're just about out of time, but I want to Thank you, Bill, Sophia, Jim. This this was terrific. This was uh, really great to have this deep dive into this conversation. So, <laughs> thanks thanks for joining. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank to you, our Jim. audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. One last thing, though. Does yeah. that work? Walking out of the party. I'm going to do that from now on. Walking backwards out of a party. It absolutely it works. works. It does work. Excellent. Good idea. I walked into Japan illegally through customs one day, doing that backwards up a stopped escalator. I walked through customs, back up and bought a magazine and came back to the plane. <laughs> I don't know how to get out of here. <laughs> you can also get into a crowded restaurant that way too. I think I've done that too. Yeah. <laughs> Need to write a book on all these tips. I like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is living. Yeah. Well, well. Again, thank you so much. This was okay. great. We we love this movie. Um, we're we're gonna show it in the theater when we can. It it's amazing. So, so thank thank you again. And to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in uh, for all our uh, films throughout the Apple Week. Uh, and thank you for sending in your amazing questions. We got quite a few tonight. So, I uh, hope you have a great night. And we'll see you for our events. Uh, coming up. Thank you.